Okay, so welcome everyone. I first would like to introduce our moderator for tonight's event. Paul Hansen, as well as being co-owner of Village Books and Paper Dreams, is a writer and publisher and former president of the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association. He's also the programmer for the Chuckanut Writers Workshops and Classes, and since 2012 has served as one of the Chuckanut Writers Conference coordinators. And now for our featured author, Jonathan Evison is the New York Times bestselling author of five previous novels, including All About Lulu, West of Here, The Revised Fundamentals of Caregiving, This Is Your Life, Harriet Chance, and Lawn Boy. And I believe we have had the pleasure of hosting him for every single one of those. Um, yep. And so we're delighted. Yep, yep. So, um, and also as a reminder for those of, for those of you who, who Hopefully, hopefully everybody made this connection, but um, Johnny's novel, The Revised Fundamentals of Caregiving, was the Whatcom Reads selection of 2017. So um, we're delighted to be the host to share the host for his official book launch for his brand new book right here, this gorgeous book, Legends of the North Cascades. So please welcome Jonathan Evison and Paul Hansen. I'm clapping for Paul. <laughs> I'm, I'm clapping for you, Johnny. Mm. I know, I wish everybody, that's one of the things that I really miss about the virtual events is the uh, the applause and the feeling the love. So uh, we just have to imagine it's there because I'm sure there's a lot of it. Um, Claire, I'm really glad you said the thing about 2017 because I was remembering the uh, when uh, Johnny was up here for Walk and Reads and also back in 2018 when you were here for the radio hour, talking at radio hour for Lawn Boy, and you shared the stage with Willie Vlotten and Governor Inslee back then. You know, Al Inslee was just grandstanding. <laughs> That's right, it was, was supposed to be just me and Willie Vlotten, but you know, a politician. They, right, they right. They always have to his have way to in there. <laughs> but then back in uh, November of 2019, you were here interviewing Flea for his autobiography as well, his memoir. And um, the reason I bring all of these up is um, number one, you've been such a friend to Village Books and Bellingham over the years. And um, but I remember talking with you at each one of these things, these events, and you were talking about your idea about a story about this character named Cave Dave, and you kept dropping little uh, Easter eggs and little hints about what was coming up, and I was always intrigued, and then you, then you let us know that it was going to be set up here in uh, Bellingham and in our neck of the woods, literally, and uh, I couldn't wait for it to come out. So uh, I remember I decided that at, uh, I don't remember which book it was for, we did the event out at the brewery, was it in Linden or? It was, was that out of Van, the Van Zant Brewery. Yeah. yeah, those guys were great. That little artist was brutally, that was a great venue. That's when I was really like, man, I'll be back. I, because I, that trip, I sort of decided that I wanted to set this book in the North Cascades. How could I not? I mean, Whatcom County and Bellingham and, and Village Books, you guys have been so great to me. And like uh, every time I've ever done a live event there, it's been really well attended. And even the stuff uh, at the bookstore when, I mean, I must've done 12 things there because there was Bookatopia too, which wasn't even specifically oh, that's right. that's about right. my book. But one I was of the attendees show one. up the other day and talking about that, reminiscing from- Yeah, the, and then the Flea the one, there's state. been some other events. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You guys have been, so it's a mutual love. I very appreciate yeah. it. And so, Paul and uh, I so actually what, go what, back what even further. What was it here that uh, drew you to uh, set it up here? Um, well, you know, in West of here, I'd covered the Olympics. I love, I love mountains. Uh, I, I love uh, stories, you know, set in the frozen wilderness. And, and I know I've long admired the North Cascades. I, I had not hiked them as, uh, as much as I had the Olympics, but they've always captured my imagination driving through there on the highway. And I shot a couple of car commercials up there in the 90s. And I'm like, man, I want to come back here and get back up, you know back up in there and um yeah, yeah. and you know I, I know that the wolves have been back there for a while and the grizzly bears and it's just some of the most uh you know i mean it's some of the most rugged wilderness left in america and yeah, like, uh, yeah so this was a story in search of a setting is that what you were doing kind of i mean sometimes it does work a little like that you know i mean uh i, I took that cruise to alaska because i wanted to take a cruise and you know <laughs> I'm glad I did because I would have never known they had Purell every 20 feet. Otherwise, <laughs> they don't tell you that in the brochures, but it's the little details you pick up, uh, you right, know, when, right. when you actually research something live. Yeah. So where, where did your uh, your idea for Cave Dave and the story come from? Well, if you'll notice, I dedicated the book to my friend J.P. Pecure, who is a poet and a friend from uh, Brooklyn who grew up real rugged in Montana, actually. Uh, and like, you know, where they had a bunch of rabbits in the basement and his dad would be go to give him a, 
give him a knife and say, go down and get dinner. And like they would poach. I mean, like he grew up real rugged in the wilderness. And he told me about this one guy uh, in rural Montana that had taken his wife and his kid back up to, to live in the uh, wilderness. And, and that just, uh, and I think his name was Cave Dave. And that's where I got the idea because he was kind of legendary. That's where I got this idea of this, this guy that's, you know, just sort of le le so legendary. They just, he's just called Cave Dave. And um, I, I didn't know any of the circumstances beyond that about it you know what i mean so the rest was just fiction but that's what really captured my imagination was just i don't know what it is about this theme of self-isolation you know i mean I, I wrote this two years before the pandemic but i mean definitely that's a major theme and and i think it's just a theme i'm i'm, I'm constantly attracted to when i think about it it's just uh i like this idea i'm i mean there's just so much drama and the idea of self-isolation because it you know it pits the the dichotomy of uh, you know uh togetherness and or you know community and isolation and you know right, being right. alone or being together or you know what i mean so there's just sort of a natural built-in tension to this thing and and of course in dave's case you've got a town that's trying to hold him back and they don't want him to go away so there's this pushing and pulling and yeah, you know there's yeah. just a lot of in, innate tension to to the theme of self-isolation well, I, I, I've got the advantage of reading this. I know it's only been out for, actually, tomorrow was supposed to be the street date for it, but fortunately, we've been able to sell it here for the, the last week or so. Uh, we've been really uh, happy to be able to do that. For the folks who haven't read it yet, but will be, uh, you want to give us the, the, the premise of it? No, but I will. <laughs> I mean, it's a nightmare. Yeah, 400 pages. Let me just give you an elevator pitch real quick. Okay, right, people. Right. Um, uh, well, what I would say is, is it's, a, it's a story of... Um, two sets of parents, uh, a, a, a father and a daughter and a mother and a son in the same, uh, uh, in the same North Olympic, or, or, I mean, I'm sorry, North Cascade back country, but the two stories uh, are 14,000 years separated. And yet they share themes and they share, uh, they, 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 the two stories are sort of a call and response that is a part of one larger human drama. Um, that's about as good as I can do in terms of making it sound manageable. I, you know, it, yeah, you you condense that really well. And the, uh, you know, I, actually, you, th this book, I'm just going to say it, and I know you don't like to hear good things, but I'm going to say it anyway. This book moved me amazingly. And you just talking about it again, encapsulating in that way, just gave me goosebumps all over again. So, that's just, And I know how hard you are to move, so <laughs> no, I yeah, appreciate that. Good. I, I tore me up to write it, you know, because as a parent, I mean, and I'm a helicopter parent, you know, anybody who knows me or even on Facebook, you know that I mean, I'm, I mean, parenting is like it for me. I love being a dad, but I, I'll admit, you know, I'm a little bit of a helicopter, you know, I'm always following my kids, you know, I'm right below them when they climb the tree I'm never out of arm's length in the swimming pool. And I always got my eyes peeled, you know, going across streets. I try not to be uh, insufferable or overbearing about it. And I try to give them freedom and expose them to ideas. And I want them to be confident and all these things. But as a parent, I just can't help it. Cause you know, I lost my sister in a freak accident, mm -hmm. you know, on her 16th birthday. And I've seen what things can, when things like that happen, I can see the irreparable damage they do. And so like, right, right. it's just, it was really hard for me to write about. So you don't ever want to do that. Yeah, I to yeah. even just to write about children in peril was super hard for me. I mean, it was kind of emotionally draining because, you know, with this book, um, really the last few books, when I give it myself to it, it's a little more of an intense thing because of just because I have three kids, my writing is all condensed into like two or three days a week now. And so I go like 12 or 16 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So if I'm getting in, you know, so I really got, I used to be able to like write four hours a day and then, you know, decompress a little bit and like, but so now I, I've got three days a week where it's like, I just got to get up in the, the character and I got to live inside it. And, and there were days where I just didn't feel like I had the energy to be inside a day because he's, a, you know, he's, he's suffering from PTSD and the, you know, just his, his life is not very rosy. I mean, it's an uplifting yeah. and hopeful story ultimately, but like, uh, and just, just to be inside Bella and just, uh, it was, it was, it was pretty tough. So that it touched you pleases me because i mean it was really i mean it took a lot out of me emotionally i think i mean like the ending i just like the last two paragraphs i was just a you sodden i was i, a I, I mean it probably as, as much as hour. i wanted the to words talk about were this. in my head and i couldn't type them i'm like oh, right. we've got a we, we host a virtual book group as well that's one of the things we've been doing for the past year 
And uh, one of our rules about it is, well, if you come to a book group, we're going to give the ending away. But here, I got to hold myself back. I, I, I don't want to give the ending away on this. So, yeah. We, yeah. Well, I mean, it, <laughs> I, but, it was so, mostly yeah, the language and the, the sentiments ending, that yeah. like that final note of the book, not so much the final action of the book, but just that final note when the yeah. words like when you reach that point, you know, you don't know when you're going to get to the end of a book in a way. I mean, you have a narrative arc, you know, approximately where you were. And oftentimes, like my arc goes a little farther. I'm expecting it to go a little further. And then I hit that that moment, you know, that a moment, that epiphanic moment or whatever, where you're like, this is it. This is what I've been mm-hmm. roping for for hundreds of pages. And now it's appeared. And I'm not, I don't even need to do these other little the, like set pieces or anything else I yeah, had right. planned. And, and like, yeah. That's well, there's that, a, people ask, there, how do you write a, a good ending? And it's like, let it write itself in a way. There's an interesting uh, conversation uh, in one of our events with uh, Ruth Ozeki and uh, Ishiguro uh, talking about the challenge of endings and leaving it both, uh, ending with the spirit of it and leaving it both resolved yet irresolute. And um, I'll, I'll just say you, you've ended it both. You did it. Um, you had a really great note at the end of the book the way i kind of frame it is similar to that is i i I feel like a good ending should feel surprising but inevitable at the same time like surprising like jaw-dropping like wow but then upon like a moment's reflection like yeah of course because it it was inevitable it was all set up but like just you know i mean that's kind of the trick it's like Mm -hmm. uh, just hitting that last right musical note that will sustain you know and it's really just more of a feeling than an actual idea or you know i mean it's just sometimes it's just a cadence you yeah, know i mean yeah. it, it, you don't know what it's going to be it's just a note you know what i mean and when you hit mm-hmm. it you know it and i feel like i'm pretty good at that hitting it i mean when i when i don't feel like i've hit it i, I just the book the book doesn't ever feel done to me you know until i can until i can um it's so disappointing. Mean, you know, I've read a lot of books where I read 340 pages and I'm enthralled and then I get to the end and I will just say that it makes the book less memorable. It didn't make me enjoy the first 340 pages any less, but it may not stick with me the rest of my life if you just yeah. don't get that right note at the end. Because that's, you know, in, in like Hollywood or whatever, I think they call it the walk away. You know what I mean? It's that walk away. And so yeah. I was yeah. really proud of the walk away in this book, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, should be. So the uh, I can tell this was, uh, it, it felt like some of your parenting came through on this, uh, just to give a little more of a, of, of a background for the listeners. So the, uh, it opens with Dave and Bella, and I'm not going to give anything away, Dave's wife uh, dies in the beginning, and that's like right at the beginning, so I'm not giving anything away. And how he deals with it is to take Bella up into the cave. Uh, live up in a cave you can start on page eight now i'm just gonna i'll translate (laughs) you can start on page eight now he didn't give it no real spoilers yeah yeah but so the the parenting dynamic between dave and bella you can tell that he really loves her and he's being a good parent this seems like a questionable decision but he's a damn good parent in the midst of all of this and she's a good daughter she loves him too I think it's hard for a lot of people to resolve like you know I'm somebody who likes to be part of the conversation so I'll like read Goodreads reviews and stuff like that they don't really piss me off I have thick skin but I want to know what the conversation is unless it's just too dumb like I mean (laughs) when someone's like I got too confused when it went from one story to the other it's like I can't help you you know go back to school if you can't Right. I mean, my, my 11 year old juggled that. I mean, it's not the infinite jest. It's a couple of narratives. But but like uh, I've noticed that a couple of parents are like, oh, he's a horrible parent just because of that. And and it's like, well, you got to get out of your own skin. And, and like I have to do when you get inside a character, you have to recontextualize everything mm-hmm. given another person's experience. And right, if that right. if that experience includes three uh, combat tours in Iraq and the death of your wife and 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 and. and anybody who knows what grief can do and what trauma can do um I, I don't see how they can't be a little more forgiving of the decision of course they're protective of the child but really he takes such good care of her but yeah it, it's 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 you know it's not good parenting i mean you know that, you know what that reminds me of it reminds me of the, the the greek chorus or all of the interviews you've got with the the outside bystanders and their perceptions of the of what he's doing and his choices yeah, that was kind of one of the reasons that was there. I like calling it a Greek chorus, but it's it's part of this idea of being a legend, you know. I mean, it's about legends in the sense that, you know, Bella basically, Bella basically, it's a little ambiguous. I don't want to spoil anything, but the second storyline involves a, a, a single mother and her son 
her uh, younger preteen to teen son on the Cordilleran ice sheet 15,000 years ago. And so Bella is kind of, um, you know, I'm not saying she's channeling it. We, we, it's ambiguous. You'll see. But um, one of the reasons, so that's kind of legend too. You know what I mean? Because <clears throat> these are playing out like legends. And here's, and then there's this, the idea, Dave was kind of a legendary, you know, <clears throat> you know, he was a legendary state, you know, you know, champion football player and like everybody in the town knows him and now he's kind of the boogeyman cave dave so i just wanted to give voice to to the town a little bit as to feel this thing sort of either repelling him or pulling him back because it you know what i mean it, it kind of balances the self-isolation of a guy in a cave and you know a daughter and her, her feral cats and you know because the book is kind of lonesome in that sense but like these other voices like the idea of community is always there inherent in the in, in the text, you know what I mean? Because those voices are there. You know, when you use a device like that, you really gotta have a good reason or it won't work, you know what I mean? I, I didn't wanna throw those in just for, to be postmodern. I mean, they actually serve like three or four purposes. I have to, you gotta put it through the test. I do anyway, I don't like devices just for the sake of being a device because it's just tricky. It's just like, I don't like Rush if, in a musical sense, like, okay. That's great. You can all solo at once, but you know, how about a melody here? Um, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. uh, like, just because you can do it, don't do it. I mean, unless it serves the story, or for me, you know, the melody or whatever. I, uh, I, I'm a fan of Rush, but I understand why you're not. <laughs> and I'm a fan of Rush, even though I hate them, because I understand what they are. I understand that I have so many friends. I could never say I hate Rush. I got five Rush. You know, I have a huge record collection. I got five Rush records in there. I got 2012. And, you know, I've got like five of them fly by night. And um, I don't listen to them unless my friends come over. But I could never hate them. I, I respect the hell out of them. Uh, I just don't like them. I mean, you know, it's subjective. I can see why people do. Right, right. Guys, I've never still yet met a <laughs> <laughs> I have, I'm on, is there a single female Rush fan? Let me guess. Kelly doesn't like Rush. Yeah, so, somebody speak up. Any uh, female Rush fans out there? Come on. Chat line's open. Does I, I Kelly like Rush ball? I see Cricket. Uh, I, I, I don't know if she knows. <laughs> no, I don't think she does. Yeah. So with the, uh, I, I've got a question about the uh, surviving in a cave and out there in the the, the wilderness. Did you uh, do any research on that or any living of that to get the firsthand experience like you did with the, the pure? I slept in a cave tree? once, but I was just drunk. I didn't have any supplies. <laughs> um, so, I, but I've been in a lot. I've done some, some spelunking in my day. Uh, I've done a ton of backwoods camping and hiking. And, um, you know, it's not the first time like I've written a story that has to do with this impulse to get off the grid. I mean, it's kind of my secret fantasy, but hey, guess what? I have three kids, never gonna happen. You know, maybe maybe a week each summer when everyone gets a little older, but uh, it was really easy for me to put me there. I mean, I know basic survival skills or I can at least know them well enough to write about them. I may be inept if put in that situation, but Dave is not. Dave is a very capable yeah. well, person. You know, you're, you're, such a, you're such a Sasquatch enthusiast and fan. I thought surely he was gonna make, it a, make an appearance. I know. Well, you know, I did that once and I don't, I don't, I, I, is there, there might be one, I, no, there is one reference to Bigfoot. Somebody kind of compares Dave to Bigfoot. But, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. He did, there is one reference, but yeah. Well, I, 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 I don't know if you heard one of the, uh, the events we had recently with Robert Michael Pyle. He, uh, oh, I know who he is. I didn't know about the event, but yeah, I know. Yeah, he, he had an event here not too long ago and he confessed that uh, two days before the event, he saw Bigfoot up in the, uh, up in the pass. Wow. Yeah. So you can go to our YouTube channel. You can watch the watch the video and see his uh, description of it. Interesting. I, you yeah. know, I want to believe. I'll just say that. I want to believe. I'm <laughs> underwhelmed by the uh, I'm underwhelmed by the evidence, uh, especially the new school. Like I went to a, a, a Bigfoot consortium last summer, or the summer, the last normal summer. And uh, the new thing amongst the experts was quantum Bigfoot, which was that Bigfoot is Bigfoot exists on a quantum level, and so that's why he's so, you know. Isn't that Schrodinger's only, Bigfoot? Only the quantumly aligned see him or whatever. I want to. I've heard some stuff. <laughs> I really want to believe, but then I just start doing the numbers, and I'm like, man, you'd have to have so-and-so amount of breeding pairs, or they'd be so inbred by now that I don't know. I'm not... Uh, well, I, I just uh, I copied the link there. You can take a look at it, you and the, the attendees. Oh, good. I want to believe. Nothing against this file guy. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, he, he wrote a book where Bigfoot walks and uh, it was, he, he was not really a believer. He was just talking about the concept of it. And uh, until oh, was this the it, first time he'd seen one? First time he'd seen one. He was not a believer until then. So he said, now I'm like 90%. I'll give it 90%. But yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> I'd like to get, I'd like to get him on a polygraph myself. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, the, 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 you probably already answered this, but just the um, talking about how PSD, PST, PS, PTSD, and grief. I have problems with that too. Yeah. LBGT, uh, uh, that one too. I'm not good how, with that. How, that how it affects our, uh, I guess, decisions that we make and our relationships that we have. And uh, it's, you know, there, you were talking about those quite questionable decisions that Dave makes, but yeah, these things really affect you on a profound level and both his and Bella's relationship and also the one 14,000 years ago the the mother goes through some pretty traumatic things and that affects how she deals with her son who's trying to come of age both of them yeah I mean none of us get out of this with some trauma you know I mean Dave's carrying heavier baggage than me but we, we you don't get out of here without you know death and trauma man I mean the, both of those things they're coming um, you know, everybody we know is going to die and, and uh, you know, um, I, I, you know, in addition, I mean, I know what I know about trauma, but uh, it's not the same as Dave's trauma. And so, you know, whenever I write outside of my purview, which is often, I always have people that vet it because, you know, as a reader, you know, if you hit one false note, you can lose your reader for the whole book. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. like anything, like, I mean, I remember in uh, Revised Fundamentals, there's the scene where the EMT, where Peaches has her baby with the EMT, like an emergency delivery. Well, I have a friend who's done that like 19 times. And we sat down and I said, well, here's my situation. I mean, I created the, the, the you know, as he was with me. And then what happens next? What, you know, and things like that. And so with this, I talked to a number of, of you know, combat veterans, having not been one myself, as well as doing reading. One thing I found out about reading versus human uh, uh, research, though, is that you'll find a lot of this um, nomenclature type stuff. Uh, and you can tell when writers are using it, too, because you smell the coffee on their breath. But like I read a New York Times piece, you know, before I had talked to Paul, my friend Paul Ben Knudsen and some other uh, combat uh, veterans, I had I, I was just kind of feeling my way through this story. You know, some of that happens later, you know, you go back in and vet things and fill things out, but you just kind of know where you're going with the story. And uh, so I had read this New York Times expose on like the nomenclature of Iraq. And mm -hmm. I was using, I wish I could remember them. And cause I like, I, I send Paul, and then I started sending him the chapters with that. And I kind of dropped some of that lingo in there. And he's like, what the fuck's a, you know I mean? He's like, I've never heard this. We called it a, a. and I get the, you know what I mean? And uh, so like you, you got to eventually, if you're going to write outside your purview, man, the onus is on you. And I do this all the time. I do this outside of my gender, my race, my you know age category, everything. It's part of the challenge and part of the empathic experience of being a writer. But like the onus is on you to really get it right. You're free to try. That's what I have. You know, the problem I have with the appropriation argument is that as an artist, I want to be able to try to get inside of anybody's shoes I want, regardless of my personal experience. The onus is on me to do it right. Otherwise, you know, let the court of public opinion drag me over the coals. I deserve it. You know, if I didn't do a good job of it, but I don't want anyone to, uh, I would never want anyone to edit my ability to try to do it. You know what I mean? And yeah, so yeah. I'm just always careful to, to, you know, talk to people whose experiences mirror those that I'm writing about. And then like the emotional stuff, you know, I can mine out of myself. Once I, once I have a context, once I hear everybody saying to me, imagine it this way, imagine it this way, I'm an empath. So like, you know what I mean? I just take my own perspective and start adding on all these window dressings and contextual changes and traumas and different things. And then you start to view the world with those things in mind and, and, and like you see the world differently. And that's the great thing about writing fiction is that like, I feel like at the end of it, I come out a more expansive person. I really do. I feel like I learn stuff that, that I can't learn from my own experience as a fat middle-aged white alcoholic guy. You know, I mean, it's nice to be able to, we've had our day, you know, so I got to write. <laughs> well, it, it, it certainly didn't feel contrived or preachy or Hallmark movie or anything that you were channeling the, the therapist lingo out on. It's uh 
it just as ever, you've got the uh, really well-intentioned, good-hearted characters that are toe stubbing their way through life, and uh, yeah, and you just you're, you're walking in their shoes, and you you feel like you know them, and you are them. So yeah, well done. I love them, I love even them. the villains, even the bad people. I mean, really, with me, like the harder the character is to redeem. Mm -hmm. the more connected I actually become to them because I have so much invested in hopefully their yeah, redemption yeah. and they never necessarily come full circle, but as long as they inch your way, it's just like your friends, you have friends that are just sort of hopeless in their ideologies, but you just, you know, it, you know, it's just the small victories, even anything, any hope, any movement towards like some sort of self-actualization. I mean, that's like that, that's the goal for my characters to me. I, I don't have to completely save them or have a happy ending, but, if they don't grow, what am I doing here? You know, I mean, yeah, what's the purpose yeah. of why did why give the character agency if they're not going to grow? And of course, everybody around them wants to, uh, to to help them in their own way as well, which seems um, villainous in some regards out of from their point of view, but not from their own. Everyone's a hero in their own story. Yeah. 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 Uh, the. Oh, golly. Oh, yeah. The uh, so. Uh, how old are your kids? We talked about this before we went live, but how old are your kids now? Uh, let's see, Lulu will be four in uh, three days. Emma's eight and a half, and Owen at the end of the month will be 12. So, really, he's so eight and a half, that's right about the age of uh, Bella. In yeah, this yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I remember, a good I mean, a lot of stuff she says is stuff actually Owen or Emma. That's how I know, you know, you got to be careful with kids because you don't want to write the white haired kid. And some people will still accuse me of writing the white haired kid. Like this kid is too, knows too much, but I'll tell you, I know when you have kids, you know, when you're hitting the false notes, I mean, my kids are pretty precocious because they're very verbal. And I mean, it's just, you know, mm -hmm. they grew up around a lot of adults talking about books and they've seen movies that are way too mature, mature for them. And, and uh, so some of the things they would say, I, I mean, my kids actually said nothing Lulu, cause she's still too young, but really that Owen and, 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 and Emma would say, and, um, and also, you know, um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I see a value in kids growing up a little too fast. I don't mean growing up a little too fast, but being exposed a little faster to stuff that maybe it's beyond them because like, cognitively, I feel like they're actually really more equipped to deal with it than we right. give them credit for kind of thing. But in, in, in our life, that takes a shape like, okay, you can watch a Judd Apatow film instead of, you know, you can go live in a cave and, you know, pretend to be a probably, cat or, probably you know. safer yeah kind of like i don't have to go you know <laughs> over the olympics in the middle of winter you know i can just you know in 1890 yeah. in the worst winter ever i just had to you know i never had to get out of my bathrobe hey Curt curtis asked a question here in the q a uh, hi curtis the uh he says bella's character is fascinating because at her age she's both vulnerable and self-aware how would these how would the story change if bella were a different age <laughs> oh, God, you know, I mean, I'd say the first thing I'd say right away immediately is that if, okay, so she's like Emma's age, she would be all in on being with daddy and, and staying. She wouldn't want to go. She'd want to go if daddy went. Owen would be like, screw this, man. I mean, once you hit 12, it's like, oh, wait, man, I want my friends. I want my devices. I want, you know what I mean? I want, uh, so, I mean, that's the first thing that comes to my mind is Bella is, is still at that age where she's still she's still and and having just lost your mother she's particularly clingy to daddy and and so i mean that 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 works in his favor and a younger child too uh i mean she's kind of the and it, i i'm sure it's part of dave's thinking i mean she's at an age where she can handle this i i, I don't think you know dave doesn't go up there if he's got an infant you know right, i think right. that's part of the i mean we can do this she's she's capable enough and you know I've been taking her out here in these woods her whole life. She knows every tree. She knows every animal. You know what I mean? She's of this place. Um, but if she's older, that's a really, Curtis always asks, for those who don't know who Curtis is, Curtis is like the rep that, my publisher rep that sells my books. And he does it so well. He can talk about my books so much better than me. I wish he could just do my events. God love Yeah, him. could you, could we trade places, Curtis? He's so answer. good. He's he's like Bob Costas, though. He might get too incisive. You know what I mean? He's, he can he can overwhelm me with his good questions. They're dense. Yeah, somebody just said super rep Curtis. Yeah, that that is his superhero name. Yeah. yeah. 
well, your... um, the and just to let you know, so oh, if anybody has other questions, please feel free to pop those through. We can save them till the end or we can intersperse them throughout. So bring it on. And I know the, uh, like I said, I know a lot of you haven't read the book already. I'm, I sure hope you're uh, planning to at any time now. Uh, we love this book so much. We picked it as our signed first editions club book and sent it out to all of our members. And uh, yeah, we get about six of those a year and this one made it, which was great. Uh, so you. the, um, you, your, your, most of your books, well, all of them are very deeply personal, but also with like West of here, you do the, the deep, the far big wide ranging epic. Uh, I feel like this one kind of gets, a, you, you were able to do both. You, you've got, by going 14,000 years in the past and in the present, you've managed to both be epic and deeply personal at the same time. Yeah, it was a little yeah. easier to handle than say West of Here or uh, like my next book, Small World is like giant. I mean, it's like 20 points of view, 170 years. I mean, it's, those can be kind of a nightmare to write at times. This one was always pretty manageable because it, it felt very self-contained. It's almost like the voices of the town or the voices in Dave's head and the voices of this past story or the voices in Bella's head. So it all kind of felt like sort of right there and grounded. Whereas like with Small World, I've got characters moving from east to west, from China to Ireland and from New York to Chicago and then St. Louis. And then, you know, uh, people uh, going north to south and over over 170 years. And so like just in terms of continuity and things like that, this feels epic, but it, did, it didn't, it presented more emotional challenges in, in, in that respect than, than, than like the next one or west of here, which you just are just, it's, it's fun to swing for the fences, but it's, you, you just realize once, sometimes you think you're doing great and then you get it to the editors and like the, uh, like a good editor is like a, like a copy editor more than the substantive editor. Oh my God, they are sticklers. They're so good. I'll tell you, if you write a book, let me give you some advice. Don't use dates ever. Oh my God. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like very specific with dates and with 30 fucking different narratives, man. It was like, I don't know. I, I, I wrote, I said, you know, I sent just like a, I waxed for three paragraphs at how much I appreciated this person's skill set. And I'm like, God, I'm glad I'm not them. You had to be so anal to like, go through this stuff with a fine tooth comb and capture it. I mean, I got like a 20 page style guide with like every reference to everything. And I'm like, wow. that sounds like my nightmare in a way I'm doing that beforehand in my own way, but I'm not, you know, I'm not doing it as well as them because yeah. and it keeps you honest. And, and, and cause if I, if I screw that up, you know, again, as a reader, that's a false note. Well, wait a minute. How did that happen when, you know what I mean? Those false that notes man, they'll kill you. And the that more you good skill around, set to have the more you risk them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, so let's see, uh, there, there's not a, just like there's not a, in West of here, there's not a town called Port Bonita, the, which is Port Angeles. You specifically renamed that so you wouldn't get in any trouble. Uh, his hometown is Vigilante Falls. Yes, and uh, it's, it's just an amalgam. It's not as specific as mine. Like I was thinking about towns like Concrete, and towns like uh, other towns in the in the region. Yeah. Um, not so much specifically geographically to an exact valley or anything. Whereas with you know Port Benito was right on the L. Law. It was literally with that one I used all real names and stuff like that too for that reason. Um, right. This was uh, you know this was a little more fictional in that respect. I mean I think people. Will recognize elements of, of, of people familiar with the area will recognize you know things about the town right, uh, right not specific names though but like you know a diner here mm -hmm. something like that uh, i always like how we have uh, writers in the audience and we've got a, a, a questions about process and uh, the, the there, there's never one way to write a book so everyone's looking for a good clues to help them do it better myself included uh, Shelly Drew asks, when you do the epic writing, how do you keep track of the details? Diagram, lots of post-its or? It's like post-its, but huge. Okay, so <laughs> I have a garage, which is basically just kind of a fam cave. It looks like a Elks Hall. I got a pool table out there and a ping pong table and a shuffleboard table. And the reason I say that is because they're all flat surfaces. And so I work with this two by three paper board. It's kind of the thick paper board. It's two feet by three feet. 
And for each book, I must go through about 40 of these and I lay them out in this big space. You know, I'll take the net off the ping pong table. I can get about eight of them on there. I can go up and down the shuffleboard table, which is 18 feet. I can go on the pool table and, uh, and I just kind of circle the room. It's kind of crazy. It's kind of great. I got a beer in my hand. I'll do this for, you know, hours and hours and hours with another beer and another beer. And I'm just circling the room. And one of it's kind of, you know, one sheet might be a beat line. One sheet might be something just about, uh, just about each, each character might have their own big sheet. Um, theme might have a sheet or else each separate theme might have a sheet. I just compartmentalize it. It's similar to the post-it thing, but I, I post-its strangely are more overwhelming. You know what I mean? It's somehow it's easier for me to gestate or not gestate, but it's easier for me to deal with these big pieces of paper and writing big and instead of like a million little post-its on a thing just makes me feel like, ah, you know what I mean? This is something big. I can walk around. I think of it as kind of like the war room. Um, and so I, that's, that's a big part of the process. And then, and, and what happens is, is these documents, we'll just call each one a document and they're color coded, you know, it's kind of a crazy color coded system only I know, but I have about 15 different colors. I mean, I've got the whole pastel pack of, uh, of um, Sharpies, you know, colors you don't always see magenta, you know, uh, and I use them all. And nobody, I, I would give money to the person that could figure out the uh, actual, how the color coding works, because I don't even know if there is an exact, there's a logic <laughs> up in here, right, right up in this right, transom right. here. But anyway, so what happens is that all those documents kind of shrink usually as, as I go along. I'm starting to, the whole idea is to sort of synthesize all the shit that's everywhere into a smaller and smaller space as the book goes along. And pretty soon, you know, I get to a point where it's just an outline. But that outline for say, uh, and, and the outline being more like a scaffolding too, like it's not done at the beginning. I mean, I'm building this thing as I go along. And, but even like, even this, even the outline for, for uh, small world was so big, it took up like five of those, but like, so that's what happens. It just, you just sort of refine them. It's, it, it's kind of like, it sounds a little overwhelming, but it makes it a lot more manageable. I mean, uh, my, my mantra is eat the elephant one bite at a time. If you just look at the big picture all the time it, it, with something that's got 30 points of view and all these timelines and things like that, it just, it just, it'll just overwhelm you. It'll make you want to quit. And mm -hmm. so I know from experience and just work ethic and, and workflow and stuff that if I just, just bear down and trust the process, you know, like Pete Carroll says about football, I just trust the process and <clears throat> do the work. And pretty soon, you know, a year's passed and I got 800 pages or something, you know, and it's, and I, I feel like I'm in control of the thing, but like, that's what I tell writers that, that are, uh, am I going on too long about this? No, I'm no, giving no. you one long answer. This is so you never have to ask me another writing question. I'm just going <laughs> to answer all your writing questions. Uh, I, and now I forget where I was going, but uh, I was talking about, uh, yeah, I forget. Oh, well, that was a long enough answer anyway. I had another tangent, but I. Well, do you, God. so uh, do, do you do the same process for all the books? Just with Epic, it's much bigger. Like you, you you're yeah. talking about your beat line, your character, your theme, just try to get everything all kind of coincided and going together yeah yeah i mean yeah. sort of roughly the i mean the process is kind of it's just kind of the process of my mind i think the process right, of right. synthesis i use but yeah i mean uh for for legends i didn't it wasn't as big as it for small world and and for something like lawn boy or something that's really personal like that um i you know it could it could be six of those things versus 40 you know but that process of just sort of getting it out there in little buckets, I call them or whatever. And then, mm -hmm. and just in trying to consolidate them, consolidate them, consolidate them until I've got one vision for the thing. Yeah, That's, yeah. and it uses a different part of your brain, I swear, you know, I mean, it, then like on the page, there's certain things that just don't happen unless I'm right there typing. Certain well, when you, have the, uh, you, you set up the structure, being able to uh, write within a structure actually frees your creativity in some ways. Exactly, exactly, yeah. precisely. Um, like for me it's just really all so much of it is about workflow you know what i mean creating so like i said i write two and a half to three days a week but the other four days a week i mean i got my hands full but i'm always it's sort of mentally, story. Yeah. mentally preparing myself it doesn't mean i'm staring off daydreaming necessarily but it's always 
it, it, this idea in the back thing is, man, I can't wait till that whistle blows. It's more like when you're an athlete, like when that whistle blows on Sunday, mm -hmm. I'm going to be ready to go. It's just kind of a mental psyching yourself right, up because right. anybody, as you know, anybody who writes, it's really easy to procrastinate, especially mm -hmm. with, you know, Facebook right in front of you and emails and, you know, all manner of things to distract you. And so like when I get there, the sooner I get in and just get out of my own way, that's the hardest thing. Right. get out of my right. own way I'm my just biggest thinking. frustration is uh when i've got that thought when i'm away from the table away from the desk away from the writing and something i want to put in there and i didn't capture it and then oh, i'll remember this in a couple of days what i'm ready and then it's gone. text baby i get i send myself about exactly texts a day <laughs> i just text it sometimes it's like it's a, a nightmare of uh autocorrect i have to go back and read right, these right. what the heck it means because autocorrect but uh yeah i had i do that all the time it's so always it's a great solution it's a great solution for uh, writer's block because you come to the page with uh, your to-do list. So, oh, okay, here, I know what I'm going to do next. I'm yeah, there's time. always something to do. See, I don't really believe in uh, a writer's block yeah. any more than I believe in thrower's block. You know what I mean? I, I mean, <laughs> you have an injured brain, then you have writer's block. Just like if you've got a torn rotator cuff, you're not going to throw a 90 mile an hour fastball. I don't, I mean, I believe in inspiration, but I don't believe it is the impetus to, I mean, you can be inspired, but I'm not going to sit around and wait for it. I mean, there's right. always work to be done. And usually when the muse or whatever captures you, it's when you just get out of your own way and get inside and just let yeah. it happen. But like on specific scenes or something, sometimes you get blocked. Like, where do I go next? You know, but there's still work to do. Go back and figure it out because nine times out of 10, it's because you left yourself behind the eight ball somewhere back here. One thing I don't like about Zoom is whenever I do my big gestures, <laughs> you don't know which way you're pointing. You guys, yeah, I don't know which way I'm going, but also you can't even see my hands. I was wondering about that too. So when you look at yourself, is that Legends of the North Cascades? Is that reversed? My eyes aren't good enough to see. Let's see. Nope. It looks normal when I look forward? at the screen. Oh, good. good, good. Yeah, everything on my screen is reversed. So I'm seeing a mirror image of myself. So the uh, as you're talking about the Sorry, that was a bit of a, a, a side thing. Uh, when you're talking about the the process of getting it all down in the post-it notes, I always um, I think about how writers are described as um, the the reason we write is to we're sorting through trying to organize the world into something that makes sense. We're trying to make sense of the world in some way, and I can see you going through that process and the physical process and logical process, and then coming out at the other end with something creative that helps to sort the world in another way and uh, myths do that they help us all to figure out the world yeah. that we're in yeah but sort the world and endure the world you know right. i mean right, right. writing is a source of hope for me um you know it actually you know my faith in humanity like a lot of people i mean it's taken a hit the last you know five six years a little bit you know what i mean i used to be 10 years ago man i thought nine out of ten people were good people you know what I mean? and now i've i've been forced to whittle it down to about 65 and it's that's tough on me so like when i go to the writing i know that even my worst character is trying do you know what i mean even my worst characters and i've written some real turds they're trying and and so that in itself just helps uh helps me maintain my faith in humanity i'd like to yeah. think that everyone's trying some people clearly are not but you know yeah, I get that from your books. The, uh, I mean, there's there's hard things that everybody goes through, but boy, it, it's 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 whole um, the drive, its underbelly is all a sense of optimism and striving to get better, even if it's by that much. It's, I mean, what I don't, you know, I mean, I like other kinds of stories for, you know, what I mean, like like the opposite of one of my the opposite of my sort of storytelling, where like basically the character gets the keys and the run of the asylum at some point. Mm -hmm. would be like something like a noir where there's this fate that's bigger than the character and the character can't really grow because the character's kind of stuck and the character can only try to scramble and look over their shoulder and try to escape the forces these outside forces i love to watch stories like that or read stories like that i don't like to write them because i feel i gotta live inside there and i don't want to feel trapped and running and i don't want to think that it's hopeless you know, whether or not it may be hopeless, I would rather just delude myself that it's not hopeless, you know. Okay. I'm just scanning over the, uh, see if there's any more questions that are popping up here. Do we have any questions? You can bring them on out. All right. 
So uh, who do you read for? Thank uh, God for uh, Shelly. Shelly got us about 20 minutes with one question. Keep yeah, coming, thank you, Shelly. That was great. That was great. <laughs> Uh, what what do you uh, what are you reading right now for inspiration or uh, enjoyment and inspiration? Well, not as much as I'd like. That's what I'm going to say because I'm 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 so deep in the writing right now that uh, honestly it's pretty hard for me to read a lot when I'm writing because I just want to write. You know, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. reading the book and I'm like, yeah, this is good. This is, I want to go do this. I, I know how to do this. It's kind of like, I know sometimes guys that are listening to music, you know, they'll be over at my house while in the garage and they're like, man, I wish I brought my guitar. You know what I mean? It's the same kind of thing yeah. you're, uh, when you're doing the thing and, and, and you just, I, I don't, you know, I'm reading a lot of stuff, uh, you know, basically I'm reading my blurb pile. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a, actually, that's a good point. When, uh, when I'm going through a, a book, even one that I'm really, really enjoying, the more I'm enjoying it, the more I'm reading it with half a mind and I'm reading what's there on the page, but it's also making me think and wanting to go back and write and say, oh, that's a great thing that they just did. Look at that little craft that they did. And even if it's not even a matter of uh, imitating them, it just inspires you to do something else and because you got half a mind on your writing. So, yeah. Yep, I know musicians <laughs> suffer from the same thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. Is there anything more that you want to say about the the dual storyline? We talked a bit about Dave and Bella's uh, uh, parenting and relationship. Uh, how, how do you say the uh, mother and father fourteen thousand years ago, or the the mother and son? Uh, Sika and Naka. Yeah. Which are names I just sort of phonetically arrived at looking at. Um, you know, uh, I don't exactly even know how to characterize the people of the late Pleistocene. I mean, they're aboriginal. I mean, they're, they're the forebears of the uh, Salish people, but I mean, it's 14,000 years ago. It's such a different epic that like right. to even begin to imagine how languages might have evolved over that time or myth. It, it, it was like, it was like, you know, we're, we're in clan of the cave bear territory. Um, one of the yeah, interesting, one of the things they thought ago, about. They've got the same problems in a lot of ways. <laughs> The, in, the the thing about uh, like ice age parenting, I, I remember I remember when I was a kid, there it made an impression on me. Something I think it was Carl Sagan had said about how you know human beings' minds have not changed, the brain has not changed, and the mind has not changed in however you know one hundred twenty thousand years or whatever. I'm probably way off on that number. I'm just throwing it out there, but uh, I Somebody thought about. I mean, there's yeah. a really it, there's a kind of a playfulness to that relationship, that late Pleistocene relationship, because parents will definitely recognize the modernness of it. Like these, the, the mom and the, the mom and the boy are still kind of, uh, you know, banging heads in the same way my wife and my son are. And, and, and like, uh, it doesn't really feel dated in any way. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's parenting is parenting kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was really fun, fun for me to write because I like, you know, having grown up on Jack London and stuff, I really like, I really like, just being on that sheet of ice with this cold blast of wind in my face and I mean without actually having to do it just having my imagination there was uh it was kind of the perfect uh it's just it was a good escapism I got yeah, one from to be outside what's that it, it made me want to be outside more yeah I always want to be outside. Yeah. Thank God my I can't get my my middle kids to go outside, but my youngest Lulu, she wants to be outside all the time. So I'm, she's we are simpatico. When we go out to the cabin, I'm like I try to be outside all day, just sit, yeah, you know, hiking or sitting in a chair. Well, next time you're up here, we got some hell of a trails we can uh, Kelly and I will take you on. We, uh, oh, we as long as they end up at Archers with a uh, you know, kind of all trails end up at Archers with a shepherd's yeah, pie. All, all trails <laughs> lead to the Archers. <laughs> Uh, Jamie wants to know other writers do I feel an affinity with or who write much like you? Uh, you know, it's funny. A lot of those people I'll be talking to in the next couple of weeks because those are the kind of people you choose. Uh, I mean, some uh, names that come to mind is my pal, Willie Vlotten, um, who uh, writes, uh, you know, Willie is more of a romantic than people give him credit for. We write about a lot of the same subject matter. We use a different, we take a different tack on it, but uh, we really uh, view characters much the same. Um, I'm a little more optimistic maybe than him, but, uh, but, but we're both romantics. Uh, Jess Walter is another guy who I really love. I always, I always, you know, just totally really 
and I'm going to be doing a conversation with him. I love the way Jess writes. I love the way he challenges himself. I mean, I, I like to think I try to reinvent myself a little with each book, and Jess certainly does that. Uh, another guy that does that is Stuart Anan, I love. Um, Lydia Yaknovich is another writer I love. Um, those are four of my favorite writers going, people who I, I'm, I'm now so lucky, lucky enough to know, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, yeah. 15 years ago, I didn't even know another writer, you know, I didn't mean, no, nobody was reading my books. I was writing in a vacuum and like, it's one of the thrilling things for me now is just over the past 15 years to be able to meet, you know, writers I admire and just, just kind of get in their head a little bit and talk shop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, Willie's newest book is um, uh, Night Always Comes. I just finished that uh, a couple of months ago as well. Wow, that was another one I, I couldn't put down. And yeah, it had that a, end note has it a was, great end. It was a very Willie book, but it had a kind of a thrillery engine that kind of took me by surprise. Like, I love all his books, but it was, uh, I mean, it was, it had more momentum than any of his books before, I felt like, because it was a noir completely. Yeah. I mean, what we were just talking about, like, you know, Lynette is just sort of trapped by the fate of, you know, her mother and her situation, and she just has to hurry. It kind of reminded me a little of uh, Noir Buffs will remember, uh, what was the one with Mickey Rooney, uh, Quicksand, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's kind of mm -hmm. like Lynette is sinking in the quicksand, and like, the more she tries to fix the situation, the worse it gets. Yeah, it's a great right, book. Right, yeah. Willie's yeah, a great guy. He texted me about an hour ago, too. Oh, yeah? You know, right before the event. Um, I wonder if he's here. No, he's not here. I doubt. <laughs> okay. It. We've done like fifty events together that we don't need to hear each other. We've spent so much time <laughs> drinking together. But yeah, we've uh, honestly, I'd say we've probably done thirty events together just because we know each other so well. It's really easy. We just get a beer. He gets a beer, and we just wrap back and forth. And, yeah. and yeah. I do all the blah 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 talk, and people are wiping spit off their faces, and then Willie will just go, "Yeah, I'm just me. I just you know." And all the girls are all like, "Oh, Willie, you know." But, you know, I got to do all the heavy lifting and everybody just loves him. He's just a lovable dude. He's just think, so... Uh, what was it? Claire, Claire says, are you racing with your books? I like how you both keep pace with each other, releasing your books at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's fun. And, and, and it makes we'll even do more events together um, mm -hmm. because, uh, because uh, the scheduling. But we're both grinders. I mean, yeah, me and him yeah. are just always writing books. I've already, you know, I've got my next book's coming out in seven months and then i'm i've got another book after that already finished that's a hundred thousand words and then i've got the first thirty thousand words of the next book and i know willie's got one right now he's calling uh something about a nightclub singer and then he's got another one going so we're both yeah we both we're both grinders so yeah we keep pace you mm -hmm. know because we're just always working on something is that a uh, fragmenting in your mind we we're just talking about how when you're away from your book you can't wait to get back but you're you're getting back to multiple projects no, because, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, different points in the, you know, it, 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 it you're, I'm, I may be working at three things at once, but I'm in just completely different parts of the process, you know, like, mm. you know, one of them, you're the one that really takes the most energy and the most concentration is, you know, just composing the actual first, first and early drafts of a book. But then the other project may be at a point where it's, you know, I'm doing first pass edits, you know, where I'm still making changes, but there's a lot of line edits or some red flags here, things to be fixed and things like that. And then the third project may be just like in the research stage or just in the gestation stage. So it's not, it, it actually helps because like, like I said earlier, like there's those days where I just don't have the energy or say to get inside of Dave. Well, I could go do a bunch of research on, you know, on, on, the, on, you know, Moorish Spain in the ninth century or whatever, whatever it is. I'm, you know, I could do research because I have the energy for that right now, or I could do line edits because I have the energy for that. So to have three things there just allows you to keep, uh, to allows you to keep busy. You know, I forgot yeah, to mention yeah. another writer who I really love, which is Mary Guderson. And I know I haven't seen anything from her in a while. I've been waiting for a new book. She's, I'm so glad she was the first person here. I miss her so much. <laughs> I had a health scare once. I know here's Johnny T TMI. I'm not going to tell you the nature of it, but I had a health scare once. And Mary I, was the first person I told because I just love her so much. And she, I didn't have any insurance or anything at the time. And she made me go to the doctor and she like paid for it. And like, she's just amazing. I miss her. I, I she moved away. Hi, Mary. I think, I think she's uh, back on the West coast again. Yes. Getting yes. closer. Get closer. Being on the island. Come on back. Like Mary. We got to finally got some here. questions. No. I don't see any other questions. 
All right. I can keep digging here. Well, we're 658, so we've timed it pretty well. That's true. I, I guess we hit it about an hour. How are we doing, Claire? Well, I'm thoroughly enjoying this. This is really <laughs> amusing for me, so I appreciate it. Um, I do actually have a really quick question. Um, I just try to imagine what it's like at your house, Johnny, like with your kids. What do your kids think about what you do for a living? What is, is it just normal, like having a dad who's a writer and who's writing all the time and who's, who's got the process on the boards and the, in the um, you know, on the shuffleboard table and the ping pong table and all of that? Is that just like, that's just what they know? We, they know because the, the sheets are still there, but the way it is, is I'm, I'm hands on parenting four and a half days a week. And then two and a half days a week, I'm just gone. I mean, I'm at the other house, the family will okay. be on the island and I'll be at the cabin. So, because one thing I don't, I don't like to mix them because I'm not present. You know what I mean? When I'm present for my kids, I want to be there. You know what I mean? I pride myself on this every single time. I love my kids so much. Every single time they ask me to get out of my chair to see something, I'm always going to do it because I know in, in 15 years when they're all gone, I'm going to be like, God, oh, they don't call. They don't, you know, so I remind myself of that. So I'm really present when I'm parenting. I don't try to get really any work done besides some busy work uh, while they're at school or things like that. I mean, particularly now, cause they're at home being schooled, you know, but, um, they're very aware of what I do and I tell them my stories and we talk about stories and they both read and stuff, but like, they don't have to, and as an added benefit, they don't see my drinking either because that's what I usually <laughs> drinking is when I'm writing. So I'm writing my ass off and drinking my ass off three days a week. And my kids don't even have to experience that. They just know, you know, solid old dad, not the guy with his hair sticking out and crazy eyed, you know, he's got 14 pieces of paper. He's writing on the walls. They, you know, Okay, well, that makes that makes sense to me because I was trying to figure out how you were doing that. Like you said, sometimes you write ten to twelve hours at a at a shot. Yeah, and right. I was trying to no, imagine yeah. that with three kids and was thinking, wow, wouldn't be much of a parent, would I? You know what I, I mean? To, well, I was just thinking how the, it would be extraordinary that you could write in that like and churn out the amazing books that you churn out with all if that I'm distraction. Really hot, I can do that sometimes for a couple hours, but I'm not going to do it for 12 hours if I'm in the same house with my kids. But like, you know, there'll be some, if, if everybody's outside and nobody's there and I got a couple hours and I'm really in the vein, I usually, now I've kind of conditioned myself to have these big swaths of time. So it's a little harder just to get started early, but when it's really flowing, I mean, I could be anywhere. I could be on a subway or anything, you know, there's a point, you get a point of critical mass where just nothing can stop it, but that's, that's the exception, not the rule. So yeah. That's a good question because there's probably parents out there, like especially single parents that are trying to write going, what the, how does he do it? How does he do it? And I, you know, you, it, you need a, you need somebody to come babysit your kids, I think, and just get a hotel room, maybe. <laughs> At the bookstore, Sorry, Paul? That page? Yes. I don't know how to do not disturb it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. Just, you know, that's, I feel like that's I'm fine. in the airport. Um, <laughs> So I, there's a question that I always like to ask authors because I'm just fascinated by this. I'm not a writer at all, um, but I want to know, is it really obvious and clear to you when you're done, when you've written the last sentence? Like, is it just you You write that final sentence and you're like, yep, that's it? Yep. Or is if there, is there right. a linger? Okay. Or I just always wonder if there's like a lingering, hmm, you know. If you I don't get certain? it right. Yeah, you just answered it. I mean, if I don't get okay. it right, there's a lingering. If I don't get okay. it right, I can convince you. You can convince yourself after, you know, 5,000 hours of work or however long it takes. Or what, what is it? It's usually about a year, 40 hours. So that's what's that's like 2,000 hours or something. You can convince yourself you're done. Like your art's pretty full. But if you don't hit that note, Paul and I were touching on it earlier, that last note that, that sustains that thing that you walk away from the book and shut it. And when you hit that and you know, you, you know, you have it, or at least I know I have it. And when I don't have it, there's always sort of a vague thing. And I've never turned in a book where I had the vague thing still. I just, you're not getting it until I feel all right with it. Cause writing a book without a good ending, it's like, you know, it's just, it, you know, nobody's going to remember the rest of it if they don't have a good ending. Yeah. yeah. I feel like the, the, the best last note in a book is like uh, the last note in a day in the life. Just. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah and it keeps on going even though it and you can stop at any point it's the same one yeah mm -hmm. yeah 
Wow. I was, uh, wow. I, I'm reminded of a time when Dave Eggers came for a reading one time and yeah, speaking of not finishing books and he was reading a heartbreaking work of Staggering Genius and he uh, borrowed a, a, a copy of the book from somebody in the audience and he was reading from it. And as he's reading it, he's revising it. <laughs> he's I've, done it. <laughs> I've done that. I've done that every day Whenever I do my thing at Centrum, I'm bringing up a printed copy of something I work on when they do like the faculty readings or whatever. And mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I've always got a red pen up there. <laughs> every oh, reading, funny. man. It's, you can always, it's, it's, it is brutal when it's actually published though. And you still, yeah. but like if I'm reading out loud, I'm still editing it for the next time because there's edits I'll make just because I think it reads aloud better to take a modifier out or, you know what I mean? Little things mm -hmm. like that, but like. Mm -hmm. I'd like to just not ever have to edit it once it's done. I know. Isn't that nice? <laughs> That's madness. Because you could go forever. So yep. oh, go ahead, Claire. You were going to say something. Uh, no. I, well, I was just going to remind everybody that we have autographed copies. And I put the link in the chat. Okay. Okay. Autographed copies of this beautiful book. Look, it even has the, autograph the signature. Right mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Careful, because like every time, you know, every time I do a big stack, I leave one that says, fuck you, J.E. on it, just to surprise me. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I want to find that one. I want to find that one. Yeah, that you pull like a nod. David, so you pull like a David Sedaris. He likes to do stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I can't it. help it. I'm mischievous. <laughs> You're talking about a kid. When I was 12 years old, I went to the bank where my mom worked and I wrote, I have a gun on the back of all the deposit slips. <laughs> hey, it was the 80s. It's a di different you time. You could do that then. You could do that then. <laughs> yeah, I do. Oh, I, my the other God. one, I used to live on Peterson Hill. Mary will know Peterson Hill. Paul, you'll remember Peterson Hill on the island. A lot of bikers come that way because they like to come around Manzanita and see the bay. It's a beautiful bike ride. But then you got to do that hill. And it's brutal. So what I would do is I wait down at the bottom of the hill in my car. I wait for a person to get about halfway up. And then I'd stop and roll down my window and say, hey, do you know how to get to the, uh, I'm looking for Island Center. <laughs> and so they got to stop all their moments. I just, I can't help it, man. I got mischief in my blood. <laughs> that's awesome. Wow, that's good. <laughs> all right well i think that's probably a good note on which to end for the evening i can't thank you enough johnny for joining yeah, us and paul for us and being the yeah. interlocutor <laughs> I've never yeah, been that and, before. you know we'll do many more <laughs> events and i just really i can't i can't express my gratitude for you guys for being behind me for six books now and we're gonna have seven soon and i mean i just I, i'm i feel like a really lucky writer because i feel like you know, I have Eagle Harbor books, which is like in my hometown. So that's my, but now I have two hometowns. So I got Port Book and News <laughs> in Port Angeles. And uh -huh. then you guys are like a third home for me because I've just gone up there so many times and I love it so much. And I've gone up there in so many different capacities, you know, it's not, yeah, yeah. you know, so. Not, uh, not a one hit wonder, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, you make yeah. it really easy, Johnny. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah. And thanks for everybody who showed up. I can't, I, you know, I don't know who all is out there, but I, I know probably a few of my, uh, uh bellingham friends are in attendance you know oh maybe yes the poets are out there maybe the Brooklyns are out there i don't know who's there but uh there that it's that's just one more reason i love to come to bellingham because i have like loyal supportive friends that live in the area so yeah, yeah. thank well, you thanks. everybody from you. thank you again for another great book johnny talk soon all hey, right bye. i think with that we'll say over and out good night everybody okay. good night <laughs>